So mm -hmm. what I've done almost most recently is this program called Leap, which is at Microsoft, where I took on the challenge of how do we really hire women and minorities? Because these statistics, they're not changing. I've been there 24 years and the number of blacks in technical roles hadn't budged 1% in 24 years, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, enough. <laughs> We're going to have to change that. Uh, so I created this uh, program with a partner and we really moved the needle in terms of showing us how to hire differently. And now it's like a nationally accredited program. It's a beacon for the industry, all this sort of stuff. Welcome to 365 Brothers, the podcast. I'm your host, Robin Shine. I am delighted to bring to you brothers from across the United States and from various professions talking about their life experiences, their wisdom, and a conversation that also touches on racial profiling in the United States, how pervasive it is, what the impact is. And remember, you can follow us on Instagram, at 365 Brothers. Also, follow us on Facebook at 365 Brothers, the podcast. If this is your first time listening to a 365 Brothers episode, make sure you subscribe because you do not want to miss one brother's wisdom, one brother's experience, and their perspective on life in the United States. Today, we are speaking with a gentleman who's originally from Placentia, California. He now resides in Renton, Washington. He is a technical advisor at Microsoft. We're speaking today with William Adams. Welcome, William. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. A privilege. Well, before we go into the questions, is there anything you'd like to share with the listeners to help them get to know you better? Sure. So Placentia, California is this little dot of a city in California. When I grew up there, the city had like 30,000 people, very small towns. So I'm kind of a small, this is a, the kind of town where no buildings are over two stories high. It was farming land at that time, but it was right at the edge of uh, high tech Anaheim with Rockwell International, all that. So I grew up uh, just learning about farms and technology at the same time. <laughs> um, other than that, you know, I've been at Microsoft for 24 years doing all sorts of technologies. And I currently have a passion for just helping people get a leg up on technology and leverage an equity stake in technology for improving their own personal riches and the riches of the community and their families. Fantastic. I like some of that. Let's, you know, that'll come up as we go. Um, you know, it's funny when you said Rockwell. Yeah. I, Long Beach, for those who don't know, our largest employer for a long time during my youth was McDonnell Douglas. Mm. Um, and we built the C-17. <laughs> yeah. And so when you said that, I was like, oh, I totally get it. Because, you know, even though Long Beach is a, technically a big city in terms of population, it really has a small town feel. Yeah. But it was that same thing, you know, it's like then you got this, you know, Big company and Boeing was here for a while. Yeah. And um, I kind of, to be honest with you, because they're not here anymore, I'd almost forgotten about the that whole era. Yeah, yeah. Right. Southern California, when I was growing up, it was all about aerospace. So it was, you had McGon Douglas, we had Hughes Aircraft, we had Rockwell, oh, yeah. you know, and all of those people were engineers. And I was basically living in the, the suburbs for all those engineers. Yeah. Wow. For my mom, the majority of my childhood, she was a single mom and made a, you know, a good salary as an executive secretary. And she literally worked for Douglas, Hughes and Boeing. I remember all of that. So, you know, hey, they did they did help pay some bills. <laughs> we, are, we are children of aerospace. We are right. I just, you know, I have forgotten about it. Till you mentioned that. Well, let's go ahead and dive into these questions. All right, um, I'm ready. First up is, what is a favorite song or movie, either now or all time? All right, can I give both? Okay, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so my favorite movie, I really had to think about that because it's like, oh man, there's so many movies. They're all so great. But 
I must say my favorite is the story of Miss Jane Pittman. Really? Yeah, and that was from the 70s, I think, is when that yes. came out. It was yes, Cecily I Tyson. remember watching that. Cecily Tyson. And it's like, oh, my God. And I was, you know, I was a young kid at that time. But I remember watching that. And that just pulled on. My, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it now. It's like, mm -hmm. all right. So Miss Jane Pittman was this lady who grew up, was born in at, right at the tail end of slavery. And so it, the story is about her from that time transitioning to, you know, through Jim Crow South and up through the um, just growing up in America and all the things, trials and tribulations that happened to her as a black person in America. And it ends in the 60s as she's taking a drink of water from a water fountain for yeah. you know whites only. Uh -huh. And it's just this intense story. It's like that is black America, <laughs> you know. So that story has, I mean, the fact that I remember the title, I mean, I saw right? it when I was like five years old right. <laughs> originally. That has got to be my most favorite movie. And then the song is, I still haven't found what I'm looking for by U2. And okay. the rendition I like the best is when they went down to Harlem and sang with a local church choir. Mm. And I must say, I've listened to that song. It's the only song I will intentionally put on just so I can be rocking my head back and forth and go ahead and singing along with them because it's just got the spirit, right? Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's got to be my favorite song. And I've heard just thousands of songs over the years, but that has got to be the song that just pulls it out of me, right? I love it. I love both of those. And I have to say, you and I grew up in an era because I, I watched it in the 70s too. Back then, there were only like five channels, yeah, <laughs> and three of them were national. It was ABC, CBS, and NBC. And my point yep. is, when something big came on, they'd hype it for two weeks, yep. and you would plan your day, your evening, your week around that you're going to be in front, especially if you're an African-American. And they were going to show a movie with African-American. Oh, yep. it's on Thursday at 9 o'clock? Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> so everybody there, we watch it. And... I remember, first of all, love Cicely Tyson, love, 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 love her. And I remember when she spit in the cup. Somebody mm, asked yeah, her, yeah. Lot. I, I, as soon as you said the title, like that's the one, that scene where she. Mm. <laughs> but you don't remember me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I, you know, listeners, you can't, you didn't get to see what my mouth was doing, but you know, when the older person kind of. Mm, mm. <laughs> Time chewing on the cut and uh -huh. <laughs> like so she could get a good little loogie in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, yeah, those that that movie, I haven't seen that in forever. That that is it a brings phenomenal you back, movie. doesn't Thank it? Thank you. Yes, it does. I appreciate it. You know, that's one of the joys of having these conversations. Y'all be taking about be like, ooh, I haven't seen that in forever. Anyway, let's talk about childhood. What is a favorite, a favorite moment? from your childhood. Okay, so there's a there's a difference here. I, I, I'm not sure I wanted to talk favorite or impactful. If you wanna switch it up and say the most impactful, I'll take it. Well, okay, they're kind of related. So I have three. So the most impactful event of my childhood was um, my father died when I was seven years old. And the way I found out about it was we were out playing, doing whatever we were doing. We came home and the ambulance was at our house. Mm. Like, what's going on here? And they're carting dad away and say, like, oh, well, this probably isn't good. So then we were taken off to our godparents' house and we we're there all day, all night. And, and finally we get the call and, and they're telling us, well, don't ask your mom any questions. They didn't tell us he had died or anything. Don't ask oh. any questions. Like, who, wait, no. who called Who called to say that? Was it the hospital? I, I'm not sure know. who was on the phone, but they okay, were talking to matter. my godmother. Okay, go ahead. So it's either my mom who was at the hospital. I think it was my mom who was at the hospital. Okay, okay. So she's going to go home. They're going to send us back home. It's like, don't ask me too many questions. Okay. Like, all right, all right. So, you know, we go back home and, um, you know, because my sister, <laughs> I have a brother and a sister. They're older than me. And my sister, mom, what happened? What happened? What happened? And you know, mom's just like, he didn't make it. And then she starts bawling. Um, right. And we're all like, well, whatever. But my response was, we were sitting at the table 
we were eating mac and cheese, craft mac and cheese. And all I could say was, can I have some more mac and cheese? Oh. You know? Mm-hmm. And I did not, and I was seven years old. I did not cry for seven years. All right. And to understand is like, well, first of all, I'm just seven. So I don't know what the heck's really going on. But to understand, it's like, well, my father was a black man raised in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And he had gone through the, the, that whole era of the, he was a repairman for typewriters. So he's in the, the schools, public schools. Mm-hmm. And he had, he had served in World War II. He, was, he went in the Navy when he was 16, wow. you know. He was on the Indiana, he got shrapnel in his hand, everything. You know, this guy's been at war, fighting for this yeah. country. Now he's yeah. preparing typewriters in the schools and the kids are calling him nigger, right? Uh, and he's uh, got to take it. So he drank, you know, uh, he was, a, uh, I won't say he was a drunk, but he was, you know, too much alcohol. Uh-huh. Uh, he and my mom got into it times. And, you know, as a little boy, I'm thinking, mom, you're, you're messing with my mom, right? Uh-huh. Hey, man, you better, you better, I, that's my mama. Right. I'm a defensive little boy. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when he was dead, it was like, good. (laughs) You Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. that was my first Mm -hmm. reaction. It's like, well, good riddance because you were messing with my mama. Yeah. Pass the mac and cheese. (laughs) Pass the mac and cheese. That man's gone. Uh huh. He was not a bad man. He did not abuse us as children or anything. Right. But it's just your framework as a seven year old. It's just the framework you had at that time in that moment. Mm -hmm. Not that moment. And that was that was impactful. Now, the other the really impactful uh, was the follow on from that. My brother, my poor brother, he was only seven. He was, let's see, five, seven. He was like nine, Mm -hmm. nine or ten. And of course, everyone, as we're going through the funeral, all that sort of stuff is coming up to him. You're the man of the house now. You're the man of the house to a 10 year old. Poor guy. You know, he's scarred to this day. Ten year old. (laughs) Oh, but man. at some point, I remember a, a, a Father's Day at one point where I just said to him, and I was probably only 12, I said, you've been like a father to me. So I want you to know that I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That was a, one of my favorite moments. And my brother, I love my brother so much. I mean, we're best of friends today. I talk to him two, three times a day now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, wow. That was probably one of my favorite moments was just recognizing my brother for the role that he played in our lives, right? That's wonderful. I mean, just imagine a 10-year-old boy and it's like, you the man now. <laughs> <laughs> and he he struggled right. with it, but you know, he helped us, uh, he helped us grow up. So that's really amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. There's all sorts of other favorite moments from childhood, from you know playing in the ditch to, you know, catching lizards and frogs. But those those are probably the most favorite and impactful things that have happened in my life. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love it. It puts a deep smile on my face because what I'm taking away from what you just shared is, because I know the power of being acknowledged, you know, and I know people, everyone knows it's fun to be acknowledged or it feels good to be. When someone you love recognizes what you've provided yeah for no reason it 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 really touches the heart and what i hear is you could tell that he really got it yeah and i knew he appreciated it at the time because it's like i know your life is hard so let me just show you some love basically yeah that's wonderful right? i love it um well let's talk about accomplishments oh my god let me let me get the book <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where do you uh, want to start? Well, here's and then see, this is the thing I know. See, I talk to brothers with accomplishment, like all of them, whatever they're doing. So I have to ask you for just two. And the first one is the one that means the most to you personally. And yeah. then I'm going to ask you about the one that gets the uh, or wow more often than the others. So let's start with the first. Which accomplishment is the one of all that you've done? That means the most to you personally. The most, the most impressive one to me, or the most thing that I think is the most is is going to seem mundane, but it was getting out of the hood without getting shot or in jail. Okay, okay. I get, I got educated. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> you know, because I lived in 
it was a Mexican neighborhood. We the barrio, you know. Uh-huh. William Adams, de la Hoya. <laughs> you know, hanging out with the cholos. Yeah. <laughs> and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So we grew up in a rough place. Our our neighborhood was one of those places where it's like, if you're the police, don't come down here alone. Wow. You better come down here with a buddy. <laughs> Because wow. these, these, you know, these brothers are going to, you know, cause you harm. Not to us, because we were in the neighborhood. But right. come around here if you don't belong around here. I got you. And there's some drugs. You know, there's, there's, today we'd probably call them meth heads, I guess. I don't know what drugs they were doing at that time. But mm-hmm. people had needles. And that was mm-hmm. over at the Sanchez house, over in the mm-hmm. corner, you mm-hmm. know. And then uh, the neighbors right next to us, the Castellans, too many kids, you know, and they had uh, two or three B-Boy and Johnny were usually in jail. Mm. You know, the rest of us were just kind of little kids trying to get along. And we managed to, uh, thanks to my mom, who kept us busy, we managed to not get into all of that. And okay. we managed to get educated and yeah. make it out of high school. My sister didn't get pregnant, at least not mm-hmm. right then. We did, at least my brother and I, go to college. So we made it out. So that's probably the, the one that stands out the most to me because yes. it's about my life. <laughs> I could have right. been dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's, it's real. A life in jail, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's real. So and- we made it out. I probably mentioned this once or twice before, but I remember it was like 2005 or something. I was reading, this was back when people read the LA Times, and I saw that there was a black male dropout rate was 50%. Oh, I can It was imagine. like 49 point something percent in the state of California, progressive yeah. state of California. This is 2000s, not 1970, yeah. right? And yeah. so when you say, you know, you graduated high school, you made it out. Like it, it can seem like a little thing, but, but it's a big thing. <laughs> it is. It is. I'm proud to say the graduation rate has gone up, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, so right. I hear you. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, we, that was that. And then my most proud in modern times. Um, well, first of all, I'll say I'm always proud of the, whatever I did last. So mm-hmm. what I've done almost most recently is this program called LEAP which is at Microsoft, where I took on the challenge of how do we really hire women and minorities? Because these statistics, they're not changing. (laughs) You know, I've been there 24 years and the number of Blacks in technical roles hadn't budged 1% in 24 years, right? It's like, oh, okay, enough. (laughs) We're going to have to change that. Uh, So I created this uh, program with a partner and we really moved the needle in terms of showing us how to hire differently. And now it's like a nationally accredited program. It's a beacon for the industry, all this sort of stuff. But that's the program that I would say is I'm probably most proud of. Let me ask you something about that. What, what did you revolutionize about how tech industry approach hiring that moved the needle? Like, what did you notice wasn't being done or what did you add to how they looked at like what it what how you do that <laughs> how do you do that how well, do you do that lot, it takes a lot so first of all at that point i had been at the company for already 20 years so i had some political capital i had some street cred i had a nice rolodex of you know all the leaders in the company so when i said first of all okay i'm going to i'm an engineer so i'm used to doing writing code shipping product blah 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 but I just took this one on is like, it's not engineering per se. So it's the risky. Uh, so the first thing is you have to have someone who's bold enough and positioned well enough to take the risk and wants to do it, <laughs> right? It's not an easy thing for a, a classic engineer to say, hey, I'm going to do this thing that's completely not engineering and it's probably a career limiting move, but it needs to be done, right? Mm-hmm. So the first was just having the desire right, to solve this problem. And then the, the second part of it was leaning on, on all of that, all my capital, all of my Rolodex, all of everything, and just not taking no, right? And so, like, how did you get them in? So what I identified was we hire a couple of ways. The number one way that most companies in tech hire is straight from college through mm-hmm. internships, right? Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you didn't come in through an internship, we pretty much don't know about you. 
no matter how you give us your resume after that, it's an uphill battle. And if you're black and came from some school that we don't normally go to, you're just not going to get in. End of story, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So you have to say, all right, you're not going to get any more black folks out of MIT. You, you got who you got, right? You gotcha. got all five of them. <laughs> so now who else, right? Where are the people? Uh, they're in coding academies. They're in community colleges. They're in all sorts. Of, they're switching careers. They used to be baristas and now they're doing this. They used to be uh, bank tellers and now they're doing, they decide to go to a coding academy and get into tech. All right, let's go talk to them at the coding academies. So you do and you find all sorts of wonderful people. So the first step was to say, where are the people? Right, so you expanded the net. Say, and the second is to say, they need an apprenticeship because you're not gonna be able to take them straight out of the coding academy and just throw them into an engineering role at Microsoft. You have to condition both sides. You have to condition these people to say, mm, there's some things, you, yeah, great, you learn JavaScript and how to do a web page, but there's more to it than that. Here's all these other things you need to learn. So we structured an apprenticeship that is 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. Four weeks of it up front was kind of this uh, training, in-house training. And then the next 12 weeks is actually with the engineering team doing what they normally would have done as intern if they had come from college. Okay, right? got it. Got so it. from the hiring manager's perspective, what they're getting is 12 weeks of looking. Uh, it's a 12 week long interview. Yeah. Right. They can yeah. kick the tires. They're no obligation because at the end of the 12 weeks, they can go, mm, no, thanks. And of course, the apprentice can go, mm, no, thanks. I want to go somewhere else, too. Mm -hmm. But if it's a match, it's like, oh, wow, you're awesome. And you what we find is that people bring to the table more than just their programming skills. Yeah, they bring their whole self. So they bring their yes. collaboration, their yes. problem solving the negotiation skills. You're a barista, you know customers. <laughs> right. And, and they bring life experiences yes. that a person directly out of college doesn't That's have. None like, of it. I, I know the experiences most people have directly out of college. And most people have the same experiences that I had 30 years ago. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's some variation and some change and maybe different tech, but it's such a structured thing. It's kind of right. like how I teach at a high school. I'm going to tell you that high school is structured exactly the way the high school was structured when I went to high school. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, you know what you're getting out of college? You're getting you're getting people who are really good at the keyboard, but yes. zero life experience. <laughs> right. And you, you know. can bring that life experience into having applications that actually meet the needs of people in ways that might not previously have been thought of. So it's really yeah. a win-win. Yes, I love exactly. it. So expand the net and, and incorporate new ways of interning right. such that you now have a bigger pool to pull from. Exactly. Instead. And so, and, and, and I love that you shared that. Thank you so much because I think anyone listening can understand why it has been so difficult to have greater diversity yeah. if the systems for hiring are exactly the same systems for hiring that you have for, you know, your dominant culture, right? right? It doesn't so, work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. No matter how hard you try, it's just not going to work. So this program was, yeah, we hired a few hundred people and it's still going. But more importantly, we trained the hiring managers on how to look at talent differently. That's wonderful. That's the key. Because oh. at the end of the day, they've got to be able to say, oh, I get it. The fact that you're a barista adds to the quality of my team because you're a better customer interactive person than anyone I got out of college, mm -hmm. right? And that's a value to me. Oh, I get it. And you so happen to be black or a woman, <laughs> you know? Right. I wish you'd give a TED talk. I'm sure there is a TED talk out there somewhere. Oh, but we were heading just... in that direction until the darn pandemic didn't slow us down. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. Look, they got look, they, they just need a time to be ready for you because now with everything that's happened in the course of the pandemic, I think your audience, any audience, is going to be able to hear you better, yeah. clearer, and get it than they would have pre-pandemic. So in some ways, we were tilling the soil for your message. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Coven. Absolutely. <laughs> now, so that may be it, but if it's not, what is the accomplishment that gets the wow from others? Um, that's often. the one that gets the wow. I mean, I've done technical yeah. stuff at Microsoft. I mean, yeah. I've invented or, or shipped stuff that's like, 
you did that? It's like, yeah, but no one knows any of that. Leap is what everybody is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you helped us ship XML. XML is like the basis of yeah. lots of things. But you did Leap? Right. I walk on That's campus awesome. And people Look. will see me as like, you did leave. It's like, yeah, who are you? You know, it's like, they That's know leave. <laughs> they That's don't know about great. my, it's like my 24 years of Microsoft. They know leave. <laughs> I mean, I already love whomever I get to speak to, but I really do pro- feel privileged to be able to have a conversation with someone who's really shifting the needle, not just, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, not just because there are more women and more African-Americans who now have tech jobs. That's awesome. But I especially love that in bringing that diversity, you are creating better products. And when Microsoft creates better products, everybody else tries to catch up and that's good for everybody. So yeah, good job on you. (laughs) Well, thank you. I mean, and and it's expanded, you know, we were in Africa, we did stuff in Nigeria and Kenya now. We're in South America, we're in Canada. It's just spreading, which is exactly what we wanted, right? That's amazing. Well, I can't wait to hear your answer to this. What is a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? And no, you cannot tell me four. (laughs) But I've got one for each one of those. (laughs) I bet you do. (laughs) Um, Oh, geez. This is a really hard one because there's like so many, so many things. But let's pick a metaphor and, and mix it with a quote. If you're not on a steamroller, you're you're the road. Whoa, slow down. Let me take that in. That's the new one. Okay, really? hold on. If you're not on the steamroller, you're the road. Yes. Woo! I like that. Yeah, I, I think it was Stuart, that from? Stuart Brand. I actually wrote it down. Once a new technology rolls over you, if you're not part of the steamroller, you're part of the road, right? Dang. Um and I like that because for us, African-Americans, I'm tired of being the road. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to be on the steamroller, mm-hmm. right? So that's why I like that quote slash metaphor. Can, can I, 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 now that I've got you wowed, can I sneak in one more though? Because it's a really favorite of see mine. How I already know you. I see you. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> So I just want to give you an origin story because it's really poignant to uh, other stuff that you might ask. Um, And this is the reason that I usually give for why did I do leap? And at some point I went to the Detroit um, Museum of Science or whatever it is that they have over there. I'm looking around. It's like, oh, this is really cool stuff and, you know, whatnot. And there was this one exhibit. It was a train car, just a train car. And outside the train car is the... A, a mannequin of a porter, right? And if you know anything about trains back in the day, porters are black men. Right. right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. So the porter is the guy goes in the car. Yes, sir. Can I get you anything, sir? And, you know, you service the yeah. people, right? Yeah. And this porter is standing and, is, you know, he, he just got me emotionally. He's just standing there. He's not some aristocrat, you know? These porters were, all Black people were looked down upon at those times, but these porters were at least allowed to be amongst the whites. Mm -hmm. So there he is, somewhat respectable. And I just looked at him. This is just a mannequin, right? It's not animatronic, nothing. It's just a mannequin standing there, looking off in the distance. I, I just looked at it and it grabbed me. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do right by you. Now this was 30 years ago. Okay. 30 years ago. All right. I just looked at him. I was like, I'm going to do right by you. And it just, it was uh, this emotion that's like, I'll be damned if my ancestors didn't blood, sweat, and tears their way so that I could stand where I am today Mm. and not have to do that. Mm. I better do better. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Now, mm-hmm. it took me 20 years later to get to the point where I could do something like a leap or mm-hmm. whatever, because I had to work my way through getting married, having children, work my career, learn my skill, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I deliver a leap. It's like, I think I've done right by you. Got it. Now, brothers and sisters who come after me, build on that. I'm now the porter. Build on that. Got you. So that, that's, okay. I just want to add that in there because it's like poignant. You know, it's just a little thing. Or it's like I saw. So, in other words, it's neither a quote, a book, 
a metaphor. <laughs> but it's a story of life. It's a motivational point. <laughs> Look, let me tell you something right now. See, I know why you were successful and I ain't mad at you. The reason you are successful at getting people in because you going to get in what you going to get in. <laughs> I can just imagine somebody trying to tell you, no, nah, we don't need that. What we're going to do, you're like, yeah, okay, but let me just tell you this real quick. <laughs> I just got this one story. This is one story. This then is I'll, one I'll story. Stick to the script. I'll stick to the I'm, script. Okay, so next question. What <laughs> is it? I'll you, stick to the question. I promise. Mm -hmm, look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what is a significant person, moment, or event that either changed the trajectory of your life or had a significant impact on your life. Yeah, well, I, I guess I jumped the gun because that quarter is the is really the story for this question, right? It's like not really a person, but that was a moment that really okay. set me down a path, right? Where uh, it's like, oh, I'm going to go down this path now because I had that emotional connection with a, a mannequin. Yeah, you know? and I get that it was a mannequin and it, it wasn't animate but I also get what it stood for. Yeah, I appreciate it. What is a moment or event that highlights your experience as a Black man in the United States? Okay, of course, I got a story for this. So my brother mm -hmm. and I, back in 1984, were starting our business in tech. It was a company called Adamation. Ah. You know, education for application. We were going to train Ooh. people how to use computers. And we're in, we're in uh, Berkeley, and uh, we had an aunt, well, we still have an aunt, who uh, used to work for IBM. She was a, an executive, sales, blah, 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 and she taught us how to work a business plan and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, and we had we put together this plan. It's like, we're going to start our business. Yeah, yeah. So we finally get it. We, we go on out to the, the local luggage store, buy a briefcase so we can go to the all bank right. and open our bank account right? Mm -hmm. We got our money. We're not going to the bank to get a loan. We're mm -hmm. just going to open a bank account, right? Yeah. Because we got our money. It's like, we're going to deposit that one check, take a picture. And it's like, yeah, we're in business now. And we got our business license. And, and, and let me just check in. So you, I'm guessing you're in your young 20s, like your early yeah. 20s. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. So yeah, 1984. So I'm, I am 20. Okay. So, you know, we go on down to the bank and it's like, all right, we want to open a bank account. We're all, you know, sorry, I, I, we want to open a bank account. <laughs> and the guy, whoever the manager we were sitting with is like, well, you know, I don't think you want to do that. So like, what, what do you mean we don't want to do we, Come on, just, you're kidding. Just, we don't want to open a bank account. It's like, um, you know, most small businesses fail and blah, blah, blah. He... He would not open a bank account for us. We had to walk out of there. You your money? Hold on. Not take you our showed money. up at a bank with cash and they said, no, thank you? Yes. They said, no. <laughs> We're not going to let you open a bank account. It's like, okay. So we laughed, you know, filed a claim with Better Business Bureau, all that sort of stuff. But that, now, I don't want to claim racism and all this other sort of stuff. But I just got to think if I was white... <laughs> That would not have happened, <laughs> you know? So there's lots of little things like that that just happen. And growing up, we weren't we weren't exposed to people calling us the N-word or anything. You know, we didn't live in the South. You know, we lived in Placentia. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it, there wasn't an anti-Black thing or anything like that. But up here, Berkeley, where we're in the bank trying to start a business, that's the first time it ever hit us. Where it's yeah. like, okay, this is why we can't do stuff, <laughs> you know, because we're prevented from doing stuff. Right. So that was, that was probably the, the strongest time I've ever been uh, held back. There's lots of other things that come after that, but they, but I think that takes the cake, right? Yeah. Of being so you know, blatant. I, I get that. And that's why, you know, when, when brothers share these moments, they, they almost always, they're, they're moments, like they're literally moments in time. Yeah. But kind of like how you said, you know, you can't say that he was racist because you don't really know if yeah. you had been white and had that same money if he would have said no. But you have enough experiences, you start to question, right? This country was built around this concept 
So it's everywhere. It's pervasive. We don't even know. Pervasive. Even when you stand up and say, I'm not racist. Now, boy, get me my shoes. <laughs> you know? It's like, I'm not a racist. I'm not. We've always called them boy. You know, it's a, a term of endearment. Oh. I know. Oh, you know it's hard it's hard it right? is hard it, you know and it's and it's work and you know what thank you to all the people who do the work and it's gonna be it's gonna be work all right so um have you had any interactions with law enforcement and if so what when like either one or two that stand out um or general not so much in childhood I, i'll say the one that stands out Okay. Um, again, in Berkeley, <laughs> home of all, you know, liberality, there was one night I was hanging with my girl and I came out of uh, her apartment and I'm on my bike headed home. 1 a.m. No one's on the street, no cars, nothing. I go across the street on my bike. It's a one way street. I'm going slightly down instead of directly straight across. Whoop whoop! It's like, uh, what? <laughs> right? I got pulled over for this. I'm on my bicycle. Like, ah. And you know, where are you going? Where have you been? You know, blah blah blah. You know, it's late. It's like, yeah, I know it's late. It's, what? It, it's not unusual for college students to be walking around at one a.m. Right? So that was a, that was just one of those ones where it's like interesting. There's a couple of times like that where I've been with my brother and they'll just stop. A, a, you know, it's just it's it's prototypical. Mm -hmm. Oh, you look like someone we were looking for. Well, could you describe them? Black. <laughs> <laughs> you got any more than that? You know, so that happens. Stop. There's mm -hmm. another time I, I'm rolling on with it. So no, I live in, uh, this area called Clyde Hill in Bellevue, Washington, up here. OK. Near, near Seattle very tawny neighborhood, you know, McMansions, all that sort of stuff. And I'm coming home from Seattle, driving up the hill. And at some point, this police car gets behind me. Now I'm not doing anything, you know, no expired place, none of that stuff. I'm just driving home, right? He gets behind me, following me, you know, street by street, following me oh. all the way up to my driveway. What? And then he stops okay. behind me and is like, you know, I forgot what he said, but it's essentially, you know, are you sure you you belong here? <laughs> I opened the garage with the opener. It's like, yeah, this is my house. I, okay. And then he goes off. So it's like, why are you following me? <laughs> so stuff like this kind of happens. It's, I'll, I'll say it like this. I've had enough run-ins with the police that I won't say that I don't trust them, but I am wary. Mm -hmm. Right. And when mm -hmm. you see the George Floyd thing last year, I'm more than wary. I get nervous whenever I see a police car. I start to sweat. I start to, you know, kind of get stiff. And what I tell my children who are Black is, yes, you know, I don't want to jade them. Yes, the police are here to protect and serve, but you need to be aware of your situational awareness. My children yeah. are seven and five. Wow. You need to be, I have an older one who's 26, but they're seven and five. And I tell them, uh, you need to be aware of your situation. Don't just be all going up friendly to the police because they could just shoot you just as easily as be your friend and smile at you. Uh, you need to be aware. So I'm telling my young children, I'm not trying to build in a fear of the police, but I'm trying to build in an awareness of the situation. So that they don't go up all starry and I like it. Officer Pete is my friend. Why are you shooting me, Officer Pete? You know, I mean, it's like, come on now. <laughs> I don't want you to end up dead. So be aware. So I'm teaching them awareness, right? Oh, okay. So I just want you to know, I'm having emotions right now. <laughs> because I'm like, wow. I'll give you a moment. I'll give you a minute before I ask my <laughs> next question. <laughs> Because I'm like, wow, five and seven, but I get it because I've also heard, you see, before doing this podcast, honestly, I'm going to tell you something. Honestly, I would have said, William, five and seven. I mean, okay, really, I wouldn't have told you this, but in my mind, I would have been thinking, William, five and seven, that's awfully young. I think you're scaring the kids. 
However, however, <laughs> because I've had, because I've done this podcast and because I've had these conversations, I know that there are brothers who've had their first interaction with the Young. police. In fact, the interview I just posted last week. Now, again, it was a little back in the day. It wasn't, you know, in the 2000s, but he was up and down the escalator with his brother in a department store. And it wasn't the security guard that came and talked to him. And other kids were running around who didn't look like him, who were mm-hmm. lighter, lighter hue. And the police asked him, yeah. what was he doing? Because he was, they were going up and down. I should add, they had the clothes that they were trying on and la la la. So they had clothes, but it's kids. Kids. Yeah. So so and why are I the police just, there? Why isn't it just the, the department store's security, right? <laughs> or even just an adult just going up to their parents and right. saying, excuse me, ma'am. You're off the um, hook. Could you maybe we don't want to have the kids. It's a safety issue. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's all that's, you got to do. Yes. It's like when I was younger, I was reading comic books, Martin Luther King and the marches and all that water cannons. You know, it's like, what's this going on? And they had to tell me. Mm-hmm. That's our people being abused by other people in our society. Why? Because blah, blah, blah. You know, you got to explain it. Yeah. So I explain yeah. it. I don't sugarcoat it. It's like, this is the reality. That guy got choked out by a police officer and. Uh, this is what you can do to prevent yourself from being in that same situation, right? I'm sorry. I'm kind of laughing right now only because I'm realizing, you know, here's what I'm saying to you. But when I think back, I believe we were, I think I was about nine when my family actually joined the Nation of Islam. So mm. at nine, I was As-salamu told. alaikum. Wa alaikum as I was told, and then white devil. So white I'm devil. like, well, I guess, I guess that, you know, more than him against the police versus saying an entire race of people are the devil. You know what? <laughs> You're seeing pretty light. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Nation of Islam goes way over there. Oh, they are hardcore. They're <laughs> hardcore. Look, I, I, I have a family member that's still, so I, I don't want to say anything offensive, but I'm just saying it was serious. <laughs> it was serious. It was serious. Yeah, right. Okay. And I should add, because, you know, I don't want to just make fun because the reality is, is I know it imbued me with the confidence. Now I had to unlearn some stuff that, you know, was a little extreme. But anyway, so next, William, if the United States Uh of America was a woman with whom you could speak, whether she's a lover, a mother, a stranger, a neighbor, a friend, what would you say to her? First, I would listen to what she has to say. So I guess I would, the first thing I would say to her is, can you share with me your pain, your joys, your desires? Uh, So my first thing would be listening. And from there, we'd go on, right? I would listen because I'm fairly empathetic. So I want to understand who I'm talking to. And then I want to come to a sense I am, you know, I mean, America is a woman and I'm an American. So I'd want to understand what's our shared, um, what's our shared thing, what's our shared story. Mm. So I would talk and listen to try to assess out our shared story. Yeah. And I would also share my pains. Right. What do I think is going wrong with us <laughs> mm. and what we can do? to correct those wrongs, right? So I'd start with listening. I'd start with trying to share where our commonalities are. And then I would also share my own pains. And then we'd have a conversation like that, hopefully. I, I mean, I, I love that. You, you didn't say unburden ourselves, mm. but it's implied like, you know, like, cause to lend an ear and really listen is to give an opportunity for someone to unburden themselves. You know what I mean? Because you, and and I say that because you specifically say, what are your pains? What are you going through? You know? And so, and then having heard her, then being willing to share your own. Now that is the recipe for healing, right? Like that's, that's actually what's required. A single, and I got lots of friends and colleagues and associates who are white, right? What I've never asked is, so what's it like to live with privilege? Yeah. 
Yeah. And what is it? What is the fear you have at losing privilege? And what is the fear you have at losing privilege? And see, and it doesn't seem like like because, of course, their response would be like, well, I, I, I. But then, but but it's funny because I only thought about that when you said how you know people were asking. So how is it? You know, what are you thinking about? You know, the George Floyd, this and that. It's like, what do you think about Derek Chauvin? Yeah, yeah exactly. What yeah. do you feel that one of your own choked out a man on the street with no regard? Yeah. Doesn't that yeah. make you feel bad? Right, right, right. You okay, do you want me to come over? <laughs> it's not us that are sick, right? So yeah, that's a that's an interesting. I I, I I love this conversation. It's like new things opening. Um, so now we're gonna switch into love. <laughs> <laughs> what is a moment that for you exemplifies the meaning of love? So first, let me let me tell you how I define love, and it's just three words. Okay. So love is empathy, patience, and joy. Let me tell you a story where this applies. My mother, who's older, she was uh, she passed away this last uh, December, so she was eighty three. And before that, I she was in uh, Arizona in one of those assisted living sort of places, mm-hmm. and she was living independently for quite some time. Uh, so she had her own apartment. And, you know, people came to visit her to give her meds, all that sort of stuff. Okay. And every time I go there, I would clean out the fridge because she would start stacking up desserts and all sorts of, you know, stuff gets stacked up because she thinks she's going to eat it later and she never does. And I looked in the microwave one time and there was something in there that had clearly been in there quite long. Mm. And it's like, is that rice? No, it's moving. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, (laughs) And I almost lost my cookies, <laughs> you know? I just looked at it and I was like, now the lo- the empathy and love and all that is, is you could turn to mom and say, mom, what in the, <laughs> what is this, you know? Mm-hmm. But I didn't because mm-hmm. she's already kind of half gone, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't want her to be upset. I don't want her to be reminded that she's mentally uh, diminished and yeah. forgetting things and leaving the oven on. And all. So tell my wife, take her in the other room, uh-huh. the thing up, put it in the trash bag, take it down to the dumpster. Nothing happened, right? Uh-huh. This is my love for my mom because it's like, I don't want her, she's already feeling whatever she's feeling about losing her capacities. I don't want her to have a lucid moment and go, oh my God, I did that? Because I don't call it a pain. So I'd rather take the pain and just it's like not have mom feel anything about it. Uh, that's my love for her, right? I get it. Now there's tens of, there's millions of other examples I can give about my family. Oh, by the way, my wife is actually from India. She's got eight sisters. So we got a big old family there oh, that we interact with a lot. And there's tons of stories about love for my sisters, everything from divorces to operations to marriages. And, mm. you know, there's just a lot. But it comes down to those things, empathy, patience, and joy. I love that. Lovely. Wow. So this has been awesome. And now this is Final Jeopardy. Asked- Final oh. Jeopardy. Final Jeopardy, this, well, this is the part where you get to share something. I like, I I love that anyone who's listening to, you know, multiple episodes, they get to hear what has made a difference for you. Because like you said, you left a community that it could have gone some other way. And not only that, but then you've had a successful career at Microsoft. And not only that, you've actually made a difference in bringing more people of color and women into the tech industry you've yeah. obviously got a commitment you've lived a full life you got now you got nine sisters <laughs> you know and a, a wife and you're you're living you're you're doing it so this question is what is a practice william that you have that has served you well in life and be specific yeah. what do you do how often how did you discover it how did you know how did how did it enter your life okay go <laughs> all right go so it starts when I'm 40, sitting on a beach in Hawaii, about to move to India. And I had gone through a divorce, you know, uh, 
dating a few people, this, that, and that thing. And I, I took time sitting on this beach um, to just get myself uh, level set because I know if you don't if you don't clean up your stuff, it just follows you, right? So it's like I don't want to go into yet another relationship in a foreign land, and you know I'm not I don't have my shit together. So I I sat there on this beach and I wrote a bunch of stuff, and what I determined was I needed a, a creed. What words do I live by, right? Oh, okay. I needed a mission statement, if you will, for my life. So I came up with what I call my life creed. And okay. life actually stands for something. So L is about learning. Everything's about learning. No matter what it is, no matter how good or bad, indifferent, horrible, you're going to learn something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the I is for intentional. I want to go through life with intention, not just be blown by the wind as to, oh, this happened to me. It's like, no, I want to go through intentionally, right? I want to have purpose. Uh, F is fearless. Um, I'm not a daredevil. I'm not going to jump out of a plane without a parachute. I'm not reckless. Yeah. But I do not fear anything. I'm not afraid of emotion. I'm not afraid of this conversation. Yeah. I'm not afraid to share the horrible parts of my life or the good parts of my life. I'm not yeah. afraid, so I'm fearless, right? Yeah. Uh, and the E is empathy. Uh, I don't want to become a hermit. I don't want to go sit in the, a cave up in the mountain somewhere and reach nirvana on my own. I want to be connected to the people around me, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did when I was 40 is I came up with this life creed, and I carry this with me. So everything I do in terms of practice is related to satisfying that life creed. So when I do anything, if I switch a job, if I buy a car, if I go travel, if I, whatever I do, I check myself, say, is this in line with my life creed or not? Am I not doing this thing? Is that because I'm afraid of it or because it's, I shouldn't do it for some reason, right? So I check it, right? That's the basis for things. And then on a daily basis, I'd love to say I do yoga and stretch and all this. Like, no, I don't. But what I do every morning, when I put my pants on and I put a belt on, mm -hmm. I decide which way I'm going to thread my belt. Think about it. If you put a belt on, you always thread it to the left. Oh, yeah. Always. That's just the way it is. Why? That's how you do it. Why? Uh, because that's uh, the way it is. Is it the way it is? Right. <laughs> no reason. So a belt is symmetrical. You could do it either way. But we always thread it to the left. Because it's automatic. And you've been doing that since you were a child. You don't think about it. So I made that an intention. I intentionally decide every single morning, left or right. Because what I'm doing there is I'm getting in the habit of making conscious decisions and not habitual decisions. And this is the only way you break out of systemic things, too. Why didn't you hire that Black guy? Well, because we never hired the Black guy. <laughs> right? Well, why is that? Uh, I don't know, because we just never do. <laughs> All right. right. So I start with my belt. Which way, left or right? And then I carry on with the rest of my day. So I set myself from moment one, putting my clothes on, to be intentional throughout the rest of my day. So that's the practice that I do. I love that it causes you to be present to right. choice. Having a practice that presences you yeah. to the small choices. Right. I like that. I go to work. I take the same streets, the same route. Well, I got two versions, right? And it's like there, there, there aren't infinite ways to get to work, but there There's are more than those ways. two, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, wow, wow. What would happen if you just switched that up? Yeah, different route. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, you might well, discover look, something right? new, right? Right. And you're wiring like your brain. That. It's like you're you're just trying to unwire the automatic wiring and, and make it more intentional. Thank you. That's wonderful. Now, I'll ask you, what did you get for yourself, William, out of participating in this conversation? Um, I got to listen and, and check myself if, and to see whether I'm my authentic self or not. Right. I think I am. I think anytime I talk to anyone, I try to just be who I am rather than uh, playing a part. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I got out of this was, yeah, I am that I am who I am. <laughs> right. 
I am my authentic self because I didn't have to think, um, I didn't have to make up answers. I didn't have to think too hard. I didn't have to, um, I'm myself. That's what I got out of it. I am who I am. That's awesome. And can I just say your energy is so amazing. It's just very upbeat, very easygoing. Um, it's been, it's been so fun and easy to joke around with you. And I just really appreciate it. It's just, it's a fun way we're, you know, this will publish on Monday, but we record it on a Friday and it is a wonderful way to end a week, like truly. So it's a joy for me. So here, I'll give you a bonus, a bonus, uh, uh, tidbit. So, uh, today, um, so I am a practicing Muslim. So mm-hmm. Friday's a good day to do good deeds. I go to my kids' school, you know, every day. I drop the kids and I talk to the principal sometimes. So oh, what do you guys need? So like Hammond and Hans, because they don't want to ask for money because they're a public school and all this. And I'm like, come on, you need stuff. And so, oh, okay, we need these microphones. Why don't you pay for these microphones? And say, like, okay, but what do you really need? It's like, and I knew previously that they uh, teachers spend like five hundred dollars of their own money every yep. year for yep. stuff in their classroom, yep. right? Yep, yep, yep. And we make enough. So I asked, how many teachers are there? It's like 30 teachers, including teachers and specialists, right? Yeah. Like 30 of them. It's like, oh, 30, okay. <laughs> so I went back home. And then today I said, all right, here's a check for $15,000. Use it however you need to use it. You know, and it's basically 30 times, 50, uh, 30 yeah. times 500. Yeah, right? yeah. But here's $15,000. And by the way, Microsoft will match that. So it's really $30,000. And that's what I did today. That was, nice. my, that was my practice. This was my love, right? That's um, awesome. And I'm not doing it because it's like my name's going to show up in the newspaper. Oh, Mr. Adams donated all this money. Isn't he a great fellow? Yeah. It's like, just right. use the money. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys yeah. are hurting. Yes. We're not a rich district. This is not a private mm-hmm. school, right? So less than the price of sending one of my children to a private school, I was able to enhance this school. Mm. You know, charity starts at home and all that sort of stuff. So this is this was my practice today because my faith says to do this and who I am just says to do this. First of all, thank you for spending this time with me and with the listeners. And I'm always left with an impression of the brother. And I mean, it's, it's just of you from one hour and some change, right? But it's beyond just that you're generous, right? But it's, if love were a cloud, like a mist, like you could send it out, like that's what you emanate. You emanate love. Thank you, because I think that's what's required. Yeah. We have to love each other or else we're just going to kill each other. So it's like, let's love each other. That's a much better outcome. Remember, you can follow us on Instagram at 365 Brothers. Also, follow us on Facebook at 365 Brothers, the podcast. Lastly, I just want to let you know, producing a podcast, it takes something. And I'm really grateful to have partnered with Alidu.com. They make publishing easy. There's a link in the show notes for anyone who either has a podcast or is thinking about a podcast. You don't need to learn all that sound balancing and compression. Save all that. Use your time for what matters, interviewing and sharing the stories that your podcast brings. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. Certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love.